Hello, welcome to a new episode of Talk Turkey. Hi, Nevshin from uh, Heat Wave in Brussels. Hello. I mean, actually, Istanbul was quite chill this this summer so far. Well, the probably political agenda is not chill. It's never chill in Turkey, right? I mean, the election is over, the summer is ahead, <laughs> but um, That's a good people point. still talking about elections, uh, politics, yeah. and and this one is over, but the next one is in nine months, the municipal elections. But mm. maybe let's start with the elections and a million dollar question for you. Did Erdogan win or did the opposition lose? I think both, both. I mean, uh, big, I mean, even we had our video before the before the elections, and we said this time it's highly likely that the opposition can win, and the polls were also suggesting that, but that did not happen. Although it went to a round, a second round, and this is happening for the first time in Turkey, um, which was a different. Also, like an atmosphere for Erdogan, he managed to win. I mean, uh, Erdogan is a political animal, and I mean, so both he actually won because actually, in I was just checking in, in all the elections, all the recent elections, what we've been seeing is that until the last two three months in the polls, we see Erdogan is like behind in the polls, and then in the last two three months, he surges. He basically does very populist. He, you know, he implements very, very populist policies. Like he starts handing out money. I don't mean physically. He physically does that too because this time he was touring an Italian, like kids. literally giving, handing people, handing out money to people. But then he's like, he gives raises to, to pensions. He gives raises to like bureaucrats. He raises to whatever in there. Like he just hands out money. He does not think what's going to happen tomorrow. He does not think what's going to happen in the middle term. He just, he's very focused on winning the election. So there was that. And uh, now actually the thing is with the opposition, we're going to dive into that even more uh, a little later, but also, I mean, the opposition lost, of course, because Turkey had nearly like a hundred percent inflation and stuff. And even in this atmosphere, they managed to lose. I mean, that's something. Yeah, but I mean, also, yes, as you said, maybe a few months before elections, Erdogan's popularity is increasing. Uh, but this time we were really talking about, at least according to opinion polls, at some point, 10 points difference. Uh, we are not going to talk about this today, like why the opinion polls failed. I because maybe add in one sentence, yeah. just one sentence. What I think, I think the phenomena in Turkey is that uh, to pollsters, people do not want to say that they're going to vote for Erdogan because it's very, I mean, it's really, I mean, it's, especially in certain circles, it's really, really uncool to say that like you're voting for Erdogan, you know. I think that's the thing. I think that's why pollsters cannot, it's hard to see that. Mm -hmm. People, they do not admit. That's the thing. Yes, but then, I don't know, should we start not believing them at all or should we just totally discard them? I don't know. That's a, that's a difficult uh, call. But going back to who lost and who win i'm still more in the camp of the opposition lost it because they couldn't manage the process because the okay it wasn't a fair election but we knew it the opposition knew it and since the victory in the municipal election 2019 they had four years to get ready for this with a good candidate a good team good monitoring systems competent people so on so and also the selection of the candidate. I mean, despite the legal case against him, I still believe that the opposition had one potential winner candidate, actually. That was probably Mamal. Was he a perfect candidate? Not at all. But he was probably the best positioned one. And probably when we talk about also the opposition, we will talk about uh, his plans as well, uh, because he's still rather popular in Turkey. But as to Erdogan, uh, I'm not sure either if he can call this a major victory either, because he has sacrificed a lot for this. I mean, you mentioned many populist policies and they have major financial consequences. He's created some sort of a situation which is very difficult to manage nowadays. Um, and this is very much related to what we can expect from his third term, like Erdogan 3.0. Um, 
his top priority, unlike uh, many people believe in the West, is not going to be foreign policy or new political changes in Turkey, but probably improving the economic situation. This is also reflected in his new government. Uh, compared to the previous one, we can see uh, more technocratic, relatively more moderate, relatively, again, I use relatively, more competent, uh, because he needs to deliver. And deliver now because the municipal elections is in nine months. Uh, AKP lost all major cities in 2019 municipal elections, including Ankara and Istanbul. And he doesn't want this to be repeated again. And Istanbul is especially very important symbolically, but not only symbolically, even financially. So, and seeing the voter preferences in the presidential elections, it's not going to be very easy either. Um, but again, rather than AKP wins, the opposition may lose. And this is unfortunately becoming more and more likely, especially seeing the post-election dynamics within the opposition. So joint candidates will be probably the only chance again, but it's going to be a bit more difficult this time uh, to maintain such level of probably coordination. But still, I mean, especially if you talk about Istanbul and Ankara, those mayors are still very popular, of course. And going back to the new government, appointments seem uh, to be primarily driven by economic uh, needs. Uh, first of all, of course, we should talk about Mehmet Şimşek. He was former deputy prime minister and finance minister. Um, he left country and now he's back as uh, treasury and finance minister. He has international credibility and he's also someone to favor orthodox policies rather than AKP's infamous unorthodox economic policies. So we are already seeing some changes, minor changes, uh, but we will see, and it's really a big if, um, if Mehmet Şimşek will be able to implement his plans. Um, another appointment is also important in economy. Hafize Gaye Erkan, is the, she's the uh, former ex executive from Wall Street, and she's now the new central bank governor, also the first woman to hold this position in Turkey. Um, and there are also other changes. I mean, uh, one of two famous or infamous figures, uh, Suleyman Soylu, for example, anti-West interior minister, he's also gone. He's not there anymore. And former head of the Turkish National Intelligence Agency, MIT, Hakan Fidan, is now the foreign minister of Turkey. Uh, he has been around for a long time in any case, and he has been an important figure for Erdogan and his foreign policy. But Generally speaking, improving economy is not going to be a very easy task considering major challenges. It's not clear whether Erdogan will give such a freedom to Shimshek and his team, and even if he does that, for how long? And we are still talking about a one-man regime. The ministers are there, and who they are, of course, it matters, but they still have a very limited power. Erdogan may change them very easily. It's just about one signature, basically. So. Even if Shimshenk implements all the right policies, also the improvement will be very limited because as long as you don't improve the rule of law in the country, democracy, freedoms, it's going to be very difficult to attract, especially investors from the West. I mean, when you talk to them, many Western companies are still interested in Turkey because it is still a very attractive country to invest, but they also have major concerns. And I'm not sure if government can easily address those. Um, there will be some steps, including in foreign policy. We may see a sort of rapprochement, uh, maybe with the West. Uh, at least Erdogan probably won't uh, choose to, uh, um, to escalate tensions. I mean, because there's no use of tensions at the moment. Um, and better ties with the, with the EU, with the West, uh, it may also uh, be influential in um, improving economy. Um, but seeing messages from the West as well, Macron shows all these uh, messages coming from Germany and France, they seem to be also eager to improve those ties eat, uh, as well. I mean, it's going to be very difficult to go beyond transactional relations, but still there is at least a tendency. But this can be only limited, especially considering Turkey's relations with Russia as well, because Turkey's dependency is now at a very high level. And I think it is at a higher level than six months ago, certainly. So Erdogan will need to really do this balancing at angst between the West and the East. 
um, but also the Gulf region. Now, Turkey is very much dependent on the Gulf region as well, especially the uh, UAE somehow. This is also very surprising because in the post-coup attempt period, UAE was accused to be uh, one of the countries behind the coup, and now uh, UAE and Turkey, they are the best friends. So welcome to uh, Middle East, I guess, in that sense. Um, I mean, there are a lot of other issues to talk about, but I will stop here. Um, I don't know if you want to add more about the AKP. If not, we can also continue with the opposition. Yeah, yeah maybe maybe um, two, three points, as you said. So what Mehmet Shimshek has to do is, I mean, it's obvious if you're going to follow the orthodox, whatever, rational, you know, classical, uh, classical liberal economic policies, what you have to do is like basically there's very high inflation in Turkey to raise the interest rates and also to lower the expenditure because and to lower the basically the uh, money supply. And so, well, th that's the thing. But since uh, the local elections are coming, as you said, and Erdogan wants re really badly to take Istanbul back from CHP, he's now concentrated on the local elections. He cannot do that. It's impossible for him to basically reduce the state expenditure. So he cannot do that. I mean, um, so the guess is probably they're going to raise the interest rates up to like 25%. Uh, and Shimshik is going to try to do you know, the best he can, but the rest, the, like the state expenditure or the money supply, you know, there will not be many, many, many changes there. And, uh, you know, reports are saying Erdogan, actually, he formed a new team within AK Party, his party. They are to solely work um, on the cities, which the opposition won in the former local elections. Uh, being Ankara, Istanbul, Izmir, this team is going to concentrate, go door to door, ask people what they want, what can they do, and they're going to draw a new like set of policies, like what can be done concretely to take these cities back and everything. So he's serious. He wants to take Istanbul and even Ankara back, and he can do that, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah, in terms of foreign policy, I mean, Hakan Fidan, yeah, the world knows him, former MIT Turkish Secret Service chief, he's now the forum. I mean, this also indicates something. Who does that? I mean, I don't know. This is very bothy in a sense. You know, your former intelligence guy is now the you know, new foreign minister. Uh, but the thing is, so everybody was, especially the West, was concentrated on, okay, now the election is over, and then Turkey is going to ratify Sweden's entrance into NATO. And Erdogan, the other day, he closed the door to this. And he's like, yeah, some PKK militants or some PKK people are marching in Sweden's streets. So, yeah, no more. No ratification. Goodbye. We don't want Sweden. This but would you be surprised if it happens in one week? Uh, no, but I think what he's trying to do is he wants this F-16 deal with Joe Biden. And Joe Biden tells him, OK, I really want that too, but there's the Congress. So... You know, I think what they think is like if they ratify Sweden right now and if Joe Biden says, well, you know what, it's out of my hands and Congress is not ratifying this, I cannot give you this F-16 modernization deal, then this will be very bad for him. So I, I think what he thinks is until he gets that deal done, he will not ratify this Sweden's entrance into the NATO. I think, you know, that's yeah. the thing. I and mean, by the way, negotiation is fine, but... Yes is never a yes, no is never a no. That creates yeah, a lot true. of problem, I think, for Turkey. This, That's right. Uh, unpredictability. Another name the world knows, Ibrahim Kalan. Now he's the head of MIT, Turkey Secret Services. <laughs> also, that, uh, you know, I don't know. Actually, this was also shocking for bureaucrats because he's not a really secret service type, you know. But they're saying, well, now MIT is on track and every, there is a system and everything, so it doesn't really matter who leads that. You know, the system is very well on track. So, you know, because Ibrahim Kals more is more like this intellectual talk to the West uh, type of person. So, you know, yeah, so this some people were even expecting him to be the foreign minister, right? Yeah, exactly. He's more of a foreign minister type. But this time the cabinet like is more technocratic, mm -hmm. as you said, like these populist figures who are really saying sharp, sharp stuff against the West, this and that, using that sort of rhetoric, they're out. And more technocratic uh, people, less political, more technocratic. They're like forefront. And they're calling this uh, the Turkey century, which is signifying, in a sense, uh, what, that's what AK Party people are saying also. They want to like embrace whole of Turkey. Up until now, Erdogan has been polarizing Turkey uh, too much. 
But now also the opposition is a difficult position. So they see this as a chance to maybe uh, enlarge their base. So they're going to tone down the polarization a little bit. It's going to be more technocratic, maybe Erdogan's last term and everything. And more of an embracing, he's going to be like more of an embracing and uh, a wiser. Can we see any there. tangible steps? Like because we'll see. people in, in Brussels, apparently um, some of the government representatives were even talking about like judicial reform and all. Like, I don't know if we can really expect major changes. We'll see. I, I, I wish so. That would be, that would be amazing. But... It's, uh, I mean, we'll see. I mean, as you said, you know, they say Expect something, the unexpected. something, they change their mind very quickly. So who yeah. knows? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the government side, that's uh, the government. but the opposition side is also very lively and people are yeah. really talking actually day and night about the opposition, but also the opposition voters, their main target nowadays is not the government. They are actually targeting the opposition party. So should we expect some major changes or is it possible? Yeah. I mean, uh, the opposition electorate are devastated since the elections. Because the thing is, Murat, I mean, okay, they lost the election, but they couldn't manage the loss. Like, you know, after 28th of May, like Kılıçdaroğlu, the head of CHP, the presidential candidate, like he's nowhere to be found. He doesn't say anything for days, and days later he tweets something. He about football. Congratulates some football to like some irrelevant, like some football team, you know. And people are really pissed. People are like, what are you doing? Where are you? What is that? Like nobody's taking responsibility. It's like they look really untidy, like you know, horrible. And now, for example, on my YouTube, people are commenting like that's it. I'm never, ever going to vote for CHP again. I'm never going to watch politics. I don't care. That is what it is. This is Turkey. This is how politics is done. I don't care anymore. So I think we are at a very delicate time in Turkey. It could be a benchmark because I think after this, how opposition handles this process is going to be really important because after this point, if they cannot manage to handle this, Turkey can turn into Russia in a sense, where we have an insignificant, irrelevant opposition, you know, like nobody cares and nobody, it's not a serious opposition. They're just in the parliament, but like, they're like a joke. It could literally turn into that and they're not, they don't even have a base uh, or they do something radical and, you know, they start another story, so to say something else and you know they gathered the electorate again and everything but i mean we could see russiaization of turkey otherwise that's my take yeah but what are the alternatives for example because okay we are talking about opposition but uh, the main point is probably uh chp the main opposition party and what will happen to the the leadership of chp so there is a big demand as, at least coming from people that the leadership should change and it shouldn't be only a symbolic change, but someone with a new vision, uh, probably like a Kremium model should come. Uh, there are many, of course, pros and cons. Um, Kemal Kulishtarol has also a complete control on the party as well. So it will depend on his willingness to, to change actually. Uh, do you think it's feasible? And do you think uh, if this doesn't happen, uh, people like Ekrem Yomamolu, can they still go ahead with uh, a different political movement? Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of stuff is happening on the CHP side. Meanwhile, after the elections, um, the mayor of Istanbul, Ekrem Yomamolu, a very popular figure in Turkish politics right now, he's from the Black Sea region, Karadeniz. That's important because that's a very, very nationalistic part of Turkey. But also Kurds like him for some reason, you know, they can vote for him. So he's like a uniting figure, which is important. He's a younger figure and everything. And being mayor of Istanbul, it's a very, very strong position, as you said, financially also. They are sitting on a lot of money, a huge budget. You can literally move the mountains with that. That's a really important, mm. uh, important chair. Yes, budget is bigger than some of the small EU member states. Exactly. So that's it. It's, it's a major European city of 17 million population, more or less. You know, it's bigger than some European countries, so to say. So, so Ekrem Imamoglu, after the elections, he several times met with Kılıçdaroğlu and he said, listen, sir, we need a change. There is a loss. 
And someone has to take the toll for this loss. We have to renew ourselves as, C or as CHP or literally in the next upcoming local elections, we're going to lose everything. It cannot go on like this. We need a change. And of course, it's no secret that he wants to lead CHP. However, there are these tricky, tricky points. There are pending political cases against, against Ekrem Imamoglu, so he can get a political ban uh, for like a couple of years. And he, but these are political pending trials, you know. And keep in mind, judiciary in Turkey is highly, highly politicized under the influence of the government. So government is using this basically, you know, as a card in their hand. They want to shape the opposition also. It's better for the government that Mr. Kılıçdaroğlu leads CHP because apparently he cannot win elections. And he's not a unifying figure. He's a polarizing figure. So they're happy with him. They want to keep him. Keep that in mind. But Imamoğlu wants to run. He wants to run CHP. He has his ambitions and he be he believes he can be a winner figure in Turkish Turkish politics. But then, you know, CHP, for some reason, is the oldest political party in Turkey. And whoever starts leading CHP, they're like, they turn into this leader like, you know what, you know, CHP is more important than Turkey. So I want to keep my chair in CHP rather than you know, like winning an election. CHP has this allure in a sense. And Kılıçdaroğlu does not want to give his position easily to Ekrem Imamoğlu. So there is that. They're having this meeting and that meeting and nothing concrete has come up yet. But what Kılıçdaroğlu does, that's his style. So what he does is like one CHP member told me once, when there is a crisis, what Kılıçdaroğlu does is like he does nothing. He let this crisis rot on its own and that's how he gets gets rid of stuff. So I think that's what Kılıçdaroğlu is trying to do. He's just waiting. Like when he's meeting with Imam Wall, he's like, yeah, yeah, okay, we'll see that. We'll take a look. God willing, inshallah, of course, of course. And then, you know, he's sending him away. Just, you know, he's waiting because he believes, okay, now the elect the electorate are really, they're angry, but then they're going to forget about that no matter what. They have to vote for us anyways. And Imam Oli is going to, probably he's going to get his political ban and everything. I'll get rid of this. I think that's his position. And of that course... That may yeah. make Imam Oli more popular though. I mean, if uh, you're talking about more midterm. Yeah, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. I think, listen, so, you know, there is that we have been talking about this before the elections. We have this opposition front the table of six, whatever. And the, in the last uh, local elections, we had, they were like table of three. So there was a coalition of three, four parties for the local elections, if you remember. And this is how Imamoğlu was elected. But after this loss, I think it's hard for opposition to keep this coalition, to keep this front. So E party can, ha can have their own candidate. HDP Kurds can have their own candidate. But somehow E party own. likes Imamoğlu too, right? They so, do, but if HDP have their own candidate mm, in Istanbul, mm. highly likely the opposition cannot win. And the AK Party will have a strong name, uh, to, you know, to lead this race in Istanbul this time. So it's tricky for Imamoğlu because Kılıçdaroğlu told him, OK, you know what, you know, in nine months we have local elections, win Istanbul again with like a higher margin and then maybe you can run for the leadership in CHP. That's healthier. But, uh, you know, if the if if we don't have the same coalition in 2019, he might lose Istanbul. Ekrem Imamoğlu might lose, and that could be the end of his political career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but okay. in a way, yes, that's the discussion within the opposition or within the main opposition party. But I guess when we talk about opposition nowadays, we should also a bit talk about the social opposition too, because we see that a lot of pressure is also coming. Uh, on opposition parties. I mean, probably, I don't know if it's healthy or not, but uh, Kalishtirol has become like one of the most hated suddenly person on uh, on social media, for example. They are all bashing him, calling him to the resign and all. So maybe this time is a bit different. So he may not really be able to say that, okay, I will just wait and then this will be over uh, because people are angry, because people are disappointed. Uh, but also, in a way, the problem is that the capacity of this uh, opposition lags, I think, far behind the capacity of the social opposition in Turkey. I mean, uh, we have come to a point that probably these people are the only hope for the future, not the political parties. Talking about 
all these volunteers, civil society organizations, young people, the, the ones really asking for change and the ones who are putting more and more and more pressure as well. And they are highly engaged. They are seeking change. And their primary focus is not uh, the government now. They are really focusing on changing the, the opposition at the moment. Uh, they really demand uh, a major transformation. And there's a significant pressure as well. I mean, as you said, if the opposition uh, fails to address these demands, they may really encounter a major backlash in the municipal elections. People no longer want to vote for certain individuals simply out of obligation. I believe that the era of, if you don't want Erdogan, then you have to vote for me, is over in Turkey. Now, many opposition voters are questioning the opposition parties. They understand one point very well. To bring about change in Turkey, the primary focus should be on transforming the opposition itself. So nowadays, political figures in the opposition are not particularly popular. There are only a few ones, and Imamoğlu is uh, one of them. Uh, but as you said, the, the process is not going to be a very easy one. I, I guess in a normal country, uh, Kılıçdaroğlu wouldn't be here by now and we will be talking about the new leader, new strategies and all. Uh, but when we talk about, I think, democratic problems in Turkey, uh, there are also democratic problems within the opposition and within opposition parties too. And that's uh, one of the major challenges. I totally agree. I mean, they keep losing elections and like nobody resigns. That's really unusual for democracies, right? I mean, I don't know, like in Belgium, like or in Germany, if If you lose, you go, you know, like yeah. you try something else. But it's like CHP is like a, for Turkey watchers or Turkey enthusiasts. I get a note that CHP is like a parallel universe. Think of it as a country within itself. You know? <laughs> They're really strong in the Turkish coastal area. So these are nicer cities, you know, bringing most of the GDP, richer cities and everything, nice coastal areas, nice life, you know. So it's like they have the, it's like they have the country of their own and they, they're like, mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I'm not sure, do they really want, want to win in whole of Turkey? Do they really care? Or is it like just everybody wants to keep their own position because like they don't care? I mean, I'm sometimes yeah. confused. I mean, some of those members, they've been there for six terms, seven terms. So it's yeah, like exactly. forever. Like their their job is politics, just being a yeah, member. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just to, just, just want to keep their chairs. So it's like now Kılıçdaroğlu is like his signal, signal and he's saying, yeah, I hear the electorate. I'm like, I hear my people. We're changing everything. We're, we're going to try, like, we're going to, yes, exactly, turn into something as we're changing. But what he means, like, For example, he had 80 advisors, apparently, one of them being James Rifkin, this American um, ecologist, um, economist. He just like, for example, he was hired as an economist and probably they gave him they gave him millions of dollars. And what he did, like he even never came to Turkey. He just did one video call in one of the CHP meetings. That's it. And he did not even talk about Turkey in that meeting. And like he was announced as being an advisor, given money and stuff. 80 advisors. So he fired all his advisors and he's going to hire new and ones. What was he doing with all those advisors anyway? I'm, I'm not sure if, uh, like, president yeah, of listen. a political party in the West, I, I cannot imagine 80 advisors. Yeah, the thing is, so what it is, like, he said, okay, I'm, I'm going to be like a unifying figure. I'm going to get votes from also from the conservative people and everything. So he started hiring, like, all former nationalists, former uh, Islamists and advisors to his party. But the thing is, CHP was able to contact with elites of these, you know, elite um, conservative, elite Islamists, elite nationalists, but they haven't been able to talk to the base of these parties or these socio-economic or social groups. So he, they were hiring advisors, like all these former Ülkücüler or former Bozkurt people, you know, like, fundamental yeah. yeah 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 they were his advisors you know that sort of stuff so now he's saying yeah there you go i'm changing the party i'm changing everyone but what's not changing the leadership he stays let's see if he will be able to stay i still believe that he can yeah there's gonna be a party, time, but, or party yeah. congress is mm -hmm. it going to be before the local elections or after the local elections mm -hmm. it's just they're discussing that and the problem so, is whether he will manage to bring a puppet or a real real change 
So that's also exactly. a major question. We'll see. We'll see. I guess we'll be talking about all those points. We will. Okay. So till next time. Bye. Thank you.